Hello, everyone, and welcome to our question lab. This evening's topic is immunology pharmacology. And leading our session this evening is Boris Vakari, and he's going to introduce himself now. Hey, guys. Uh, thank you, Sean. My name is Paris. I'm a dermatology resident here at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I originally graduated from pharmacy school in St. Louis, Missouri, and then went back home to Michigan to do medical school. I'm now doing my residency, and I'm also uh, working with USMLE RX as an RX coach, uh, working one on one with students to help prepare them for the USMLE Step 1 and Step 2 CK as well. And I'm happy to help lead tonight's session. So, without any further ado, let's get into our first question of the evening. As you can see, the answer choices are not there, they're covered up, and that is by design. That's because our first step is to cover up the answer choices, and we do that because we do not want your thought process to be guided or dictated by the answer choices. And we don't want you to see an answer choice that you're unfamiliar with, which may cause you to panic as you're trying to answer the question. So the answer choices have been removed, and after that, we will read the lead-in. The lead-in is the last sentence or the question itself. And the reason we do that is because we want you to know what the test writer is asking so that when you're reading the question or the vignette, you can pick up on all of the relevant clues without having to reread the question and waste valuable time. So we're going to go ahead and read that lead in now. What other symptom related to his new diagnosis is the patient most likely to experience? What other symptom related to his new diagnosis is the patient most likely to experience? Once we read the lead-in, we'd like to ask our students how many steps they believe this question will require. That allows us to keep an organized thought process and make sure we're answering the correct question without missing any key steps. An example of a one-step question could be where you're asked for the diagnosis. An example of a two-step question could be where you're asked for the treatment for a diagnosis. And an example of a three-step question could be where they ask you what is the mechanism of action for a treatment for a diagnosis. So I'll give all of you a few seconds to respond in the question box and let us know how many steps you believe this question will require, and then we'll move on to the vignette. I see the responses coming in. I also see some first time attendees. We wanna welcome all of you. And with that, we're going to go ahead and read the vignette. Now in your sessions with your coach, You'll normally stop after every sentence and the coach will ask you, what do you think is important? What do you wanna highlight? What's on your list of differentials? What's your thought process like? And that allows us to really see how you're thinking and applying what you know, so we can identify your individual strengths and weaknesses and any test taking deficiencies if you have them. We don't have time to do that with you all of you. Uh, we're unable to do that actually with all of you today because there's so many of you. So I'll pause briefly after every sentence to give you a few moments to gather your thoughts. So here we go. A 37-year-old HIV-positive patient presents to the clinic worried about the appearance of a rash on his face, arms, and legs. Physical examination reveals multiple reddish-purple raised macules and nodules on these areas, like those shown in the image. On further questioning, the patient discloses that he discontinued his highly active antiretroviral therapy or heart a few months ago because of adverse side effects. So once again, what other symptom related to his new diagnosis is the patient most likely to experience? So I'll give all of you a few moments here to think about the relevant clues in this vignette as I hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. So we'll go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette in the lead-in. So starting off with the vignette, you know, anytime you have demographics, um, age, and anything about the patient right off the bat, important to take note of that. So immediately they're telling us uh, this is a young patient who has HIV. So automatically uh, we should start to think about things that are maybe associated with HIV. They're telling us about this rash, um, I love rashes, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and they're giving us some description of the rashes as well. We even get an image there as well, okay? They also give us some social history 
Um, anytime you have any relevant social history, especially when it's taking up, you know, two lines like that, it's important um, to take note of why are they giving that to us. So a couple highlights there about him stopping his medications. Then in terms of the lead-in, they're asking specifically, um, you know, in about the new diagnosis, uh, what other symptom could this patient experience? So how many steps is this question? Well, I think, one, we need to figure out what's going on with him. Um, two, we need to figure out, um, or, you know, I think one, maybe what is the diagnosis this patient has? Um, and then two, based off that diagnosis, uh, what other symptom could he experience? So I think we need to come uh, probably answer two steps here, okay? So with those two steps, let's take a look at the answer choices. So we have five answer choices here, and what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna start at the bottom and we're gonna work our way up to the top. So I'm gonna start with answer choice E and work my way up to answer choice A. And we recommend that students do this. The reason we recommend this is because, you know, a lot of times we'll see students who uh, start at the top, they'll see something they like, and then they'll select that without having gone through all the answer choices. Um, and in fact, actually end up getting that question wrong. So we recommend that you start at the bottom and work your way up so you don't do that and you don't bias yourselves and you can get through all the answer choices. So we're gonna go ahead and do that now. Answer choice E, seizures. D, excessive tearing. C, bradycardia. B, black stool. And A, arthritis. So we're gonna go ahead and open up that poll go ahead and select the answer choice or the symptom that you think this patient is most likely to experience, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent, thank you, Boris. As you can see, the poll is open. We're going to wait until about two thirds of you have responded before we close the poll and go over the correct and incorrect answers. As always, we do have a raffle and a special offer for all of you in attendance, so we encourage you to stick around until the very end because you must be present to win. I see the responses coming in. We'll give all of you a few more moments here. All right, let's take a look and see what you selected. So it looks like in first place, we have black stool with 43% of you selecting answer choice B. Second and third place were pretty close with arthritis and seizures in number two and number three. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is B, black stool, and 43% of you got it right. So well done, everybody. I'm gonna hand it off to Paris so he can explain to us why B is the correct answer and why the other answer choices are incorrect. Paris. Thank you, Sean. Great job, guys. So uh, yes, this is answer choice B or black stool. So we know this is an HIV positive individual who stopped their medication, stopped their highly an active antiretroviral therapy for heart. So once they do that, um, one, they're at risk specifically of developing you know, illnesses uh, that we would call AIDS-associated illnesses or AIDS-defining illnesses, um, especially once that virus starts to proliferate in their body again, okay? So what they're getting at with this rash is those are the cutaneous lesions associated with Kaposi's sarcoma. And hopefully you guys were able to pick up on that. So basically what's going on is you have a malignant proliferation of vascular cells, specifically endothelial cells. Um, and it arises most commonly in the setting of HHV8 or human herpes virus 8 infection um, in the host, okay? So le lesions like this, we'll talk a little bit more about their presentation. Um, on the next slide, actually, Sean has gone ahead and pulled up, actually, um, a couple information. So at the very top, you can see human herpes virus 8. The clinical significance is that it's seen in Kaposi's sarcoma, which is a neoplasm of endothelial cells. And you can get dark, violaceous, uh, usually uh, papules or plaques and nodules, 
okay? And these are vascular proliferations. It can also affect the GI tract um, as well as the lungs. And then when we look at the another area in first aid, under the vascular tumors of the skin, you can also see that Kaposi sarcoma is underneath that in that table as well, which is also an endothelial malignancy, most commonly affects the skin, but can also affect the mouth and the GI tract, okay? And as mentioned, associated with HHV8 infection and HIV. So whenever in our clinic, whenever we come across a patient who has Kaposi's sarcoma, if we diagnose it, um, we obviously check to see if they have a history of HIV. And we also actually send them to our GI friends and colleagues to make sure that they don't have any involvement of their GI tract. Because if they do, they could bleed and that would present with black stool, especially if it's an upper GI bleed, okay? So going back to our vignette and our lead-in, Hopefully that explains why black stools would be the best answer because if they have GI involvement and it's a vascular proliferation, well, it could bleed. And as mentioned, it could lead to uh, present as black stool, okay? So the other answer choices, why are those incorrect? Well, seizures, answer choice E. Um, this is probably getting at something more of an infectious process in, in an HIV patient. So someone with toxoplasmosis, or maybe lymphoma of the brain, um, but you would have other manifestations such as headache, confusion, maybe fever as well, um, none of which are told to us in this patient. Answer choice D, excessive tearing. Um, this usually is caused by something that may be obstructing the nasal lacrimal duct. Um, so if they have any infection with, um, you know, common bug strep pneumo, um, hemophilus influenza adenovirus, um, nothing uh, suggesting that they have those types of infection as well. Answer choice C, bradycardia. Um, this could be uh, most likely in the setting of HIV if the patient has some sort of infection and they're treated with the medication, such as amphotericin B for, you know, let's say a disseminated fungal infection, um, that could result in bradycardia. However, that's not what's going on in this patient. Um, and then lastly, answer choice A, arthritis. Um, patients with HIV can develop arthritis either as a manifestation of infection or actually just independent. You can have HIV-associated joint pains and arthritis. Um, however, there's um, wouldn't that wouldn't explain what's going on with the cutaneous lesions as well. So the better answer choice here uh, would be black stool picking up that this was Kaposi sarcoma or KS. So nice job on this question. Well, great job, everyone. Thank you very much, Par, for the great explanation. Let's go ahead and move on to our second question of the evening. Once again, the answer choices are covered up. As I mentioned, that is by design. And we will begin with the lead-in. If this question looks familiar to some of you veterans, it should be because we actually did this question last time when we covered immunology in our question lab. So here we go. Which of the following vaccines induces only humoral immunity? Once again, which of the following vaccines induces only humoral immunity? I'll give all of you a few moments here to let us know in the question box how many steps you believe this question will require before we move on and read the vignette. All right, I see some responses coming in. Let's go ahead and read that vignette. Now, I do see a lot of people jumping ahead and mentioning the diagnosis or the condition. Please remember that this is not a race. We want you to really follow this process as much as you can so that you can uh, uh, really learn uh, and employ these good habits uh, without missing any valuable steps. Here we go. A 45-year-old man presents to the clinic for routine evaluation in early autumn. He has no significant past medical history, no known drug allergies, and takes no medications on a regular basis. His physical exam is significant only for moderate truncal obesity and a large mole on his left forearm with moderately irregular borders. He states that he has not received any vaccinations in his lifetime as he did not have access to health care growing up. He does mention that he will be traveling extensively to Northern Europe and would like to know if he needs any vaccines 
prior to his departure. Which of the following vaccines induces only humoral immunity? And with that, I'll hand it off to Boris. Thank you, Sean. So once again, we are going to go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette and the lead-in. So one of the things that Sean mentioned is, you know, it's important to look at that lead-in and read that first, um, really to get a sense of what this question is asking for. And this is one where maybe you're, you're starting to sense that you may not really even need a lot of that information in the vignette. Um, this could be something where the answer choices really help you out. However, you know, for completion's sake, we're going to go ahead and show you uh, what we think are important clues uh, in this vignette and the lead-in. So again, demographics, this is a 45-year-old male um, coming in in a specific season in autumn, okay? Um, they give us a little bit of medical history about him, which is important to make note. Um, and then they also tell us that he specifically has not received any vaccinations in his lifetime going to be traveling to Northern Europe. Um, anytime you're given that clue that he's a patient's never received any vaccinations, always start adding things into your differential about um, infectious, sorry, infections uh, that uh, we're commonly vaccinated against. Um, so start thinking especially of those. So looking then in the lead in, this is asking specifically about vaccines that induce only humoral humoral immunity. So as we expected, not a lot there in the, um, the vignette um, that we really need per se. So how many steps is this question? Well, I think maybe you could argue this is a one-step question, you know, which vaccines induce humoral immunity. Um, I think you could argue that there's an additional step of needing to know, and, I, and I'm not going to go too much into it without giving it away, but um, you know, the type of vaccine, um, what kind of response will that generate? Um, so let's take a look at those answer choices and see what we're working with here. So again, we have five answer choices. And again, I'm going to start at the bottom and I'm going to work my way up to the top. So answer choice E, yellow fever vaccine. D, smallpox vaccine. C, oral polio vaccine. B, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. And A, influenza vaccine intramuscular. So we're going to go ahead and open up that poll. Of those choices, go ahead and select the vaccine that you think induces only humoral immunity. And we will talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent. So we'll give all of you a few moments here to select what you believe is the correct answer. And then, as always, we'll go over the incorrect and correct answer choices. Remember that when you're doing questions, it's important to review not only the correct answer, but also the incorrect ones. Even if you got the question right, you want to make sure that you got it right for the right reasons. We'll give all of you a few more moments here. Next week's topic, for those of you who are asking, is psychiatry. So next week's topic is going to be psychiatry. I see the responses coming in. We'll give you a few more moments here. Looks like there's already a clear favorite. So let's see what you selected. And it looks like half of you selected A, influenza vaccine intramuscular. And in second place with 23% of you selecting was answer choice C, oral polio vaccine. Let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is indeed A, influenza vaccine intramuscular. I'm glad the veterans are paying attention because last time we did this question, only about 30% of us got it right. So we're making progress. Great job, everyone. Let me hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. Yes, great job, guys. So um, the intramuscular influenza vaccine um, is the only one of those answer choices that only induces humoral immunity. It is an inactivated vaccine and does not produce cell-mediated immunity. So on the next slide, Sean has actually gone ahead and pulled up a table about vaccination, specifically the differences between live attenuated vaccines and killed or inactivated vaccines. So you can see there under the row of killed or inactivated vaccines, which is what the in intramuscular influenza vaccine is, that it mainly induces a humoral response, okay? As a result, it is a little bit of a weaker immune response, but it's safer. 
So that's kind of the trade-off. And there are a few um, main types of inac inactivated vaccines that we should definitely know um, as listed there under that column labeled examples, okay? In contrast, live attenuated vaccines, such as uh, MMR or measles, mumps, rubella, oral polio, smallpox, and yellow, yellow fever, these induce both a cellular and a humoral response. And you can see that as Sean is underlying, that's actually bolded in the description, okay? So what ends up happening is that these live attenuated viruses um, are capable of replicating slightly within the recipient, and it's, um, well, thus that virus will be processed by cells, it'll be presented um, on, you know, MHC molecules where they can produce a T lymphocyte response. So in that way, you are also getting a cellular response, okay? Of note, it is the intramuscular influenza vaccine that is inactivated, and there is an intranasal form of influenza that is considered a live attenuated virus vaccine. So make sure you are paying attention to those little details as well, okay? So great job with this question. We'll take a look back at the other answer choices real quick. Um, I don't think we'll have to spend too much time, but hopefully you can see there that uh, E, D, C, and B, those are all examples of live attenuated vaccines, okay? You can see there in under those examples, MMR is there, smallpox is there, yellow fever is there, and then the oral polio vaccine as well, okay? So hopefully this, uh, this concept um, is better understood for you guys right now, and I'll pass it back to you, Sean. Excellent. Great job, everyone. That was a challenging question, but half of you got it right. For those of you who are not getting questions right this evening, don't worry about it. This is a learning process. Our goal is to get you ready for test day. And one of the things that you can do in order to get ready for exams, well, you're, whether you're you know, an, an M1 studying for block exams, whether you're studying for your comp, whether you're studying for your USMLE Step 1 or Step 2, is get the advice and guidance of a coach, right? Because oftentimes students don't know where to start or they spend a lot of time studying, but they don't see the results that they want to see. So let me get, open up a poll and I want to ask all of you, how would you describe the results you are seeing after your study sessions? Please let us know and be completely honest. Like I said, all of these responses are completely anonymous. We'll give you a few moments here to submit your responses, then we'll move on. Like I said, we'll wait until about two thirds of you have responded. I see the responses coming in pretty slowly. Once again, we encourage you to participate. And I'll remind you once again that the answer choices are completely anonymous. or uh, answer uh, selections, rather. All right, we'll give you a few more moments here. And let's take a look and see how our crowd is feeling this evening about the results they're seeing after their study sessions. So as you can see, about 16% of the audience is saying, I am seeing great results and I'm happy. But a majority of people are saying the results do not match my efforts, I'm plateauing, or I'm spending too much time and falling behind. Well, we encourage all of you to look into coaching because with coaching, what we'll do is we'll take the guesswork out of studying, we'll use our expertise, Boris's expertise, experts, uh, coaches like Alec, who have been successful and have gone through what you're going through. We'll help guide you, help you pinpoint your strengths and weaknesses, help you create a personalized study plan, and then work with you individually to identify your knowledge gaps and bridge them, identify any test taking deficiencies you have and work to address them to make you a master test taker. And even if you're already doing great, a coach will help you do even better, right? So whether you're in medical school studying for exams while you're in school, whether you're, you're studying for comp or your uh, uh, you know, uh, USMLE exams or, or Comlex even, feel free to reach out to us if you want the help of an experienced coach. Right. We've authored our own uh, uh, materials, which is unique uh, when it comes to tutoring companies. We have our own assessments, which we'll administer to get that baseline. And because of, we have created our own resources, such as our question, uh, uh, our question bank QMAX, our flashbacks, our express videos, and of course, RxBricks, we're able to bring all of that expertise and data to help assist you and get, to where, get you to where you want to be 
in, uh, in a lesser amount of time. Our students always tell us that when they came to us, not only did they do better, but they got to where they wanted to be in a shorter period of time. So if you're interested in working with one of our experienced Rx coaches, we encourage you to visit us at rx-coach.com. That's rx-coach.com. You can set up a free consultation to discuss the tutoring program and the coaching program and how it can benefit you. Once again, that's rx- or rx-coach.com. As you can see, we have a great uh, student satisfaction rating. We have had students do extremely well with students, you know, gaining even upwards of 80 points, an 80 point increase on the USMLE. So we've had several students very recently who have broken uh, that 250 and 260 mark as well. So no matter where you are, what your baseline is and what your goals are, we will work with you individually to help you accomplish them. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and move on to our third question of the evening. As I mentioned, we do have a special offer and a raffle at the end. You must be present to win. So we encourage all of you to stick around. Question number three, as you can see, the answer choices are covered up and we will begin with the lead-in. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? I'll give all of you a few moments here to let us know in the question box how many steps you believe this question will require. I did see a question about what you can expect on a consultation. On the consultation, we will discuss the tutoring program and how it can benefit you. So that is what we do in the consults. I see the responses coming in, so let's go ahead and read that vignette. A 28-year-old man comes to his primary care doctor because of a two-day history of red discoloration of his right eye and joint pains that first began in his right elbow and right shoulder. 10 days ago, he was treated for a chlamydial urethritis with doxycycline. The urethral discharge initially got better, but now has returned. There is no history of arthritis. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So we'll give all of you a few moments here to start thinking about what the important clues are in this vignette as I hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. So once again, we are going to go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette in the lead-in. And again, demographics. So we have a, a young male adult here with us, a 28-year-old male. Okay. They're giving us some signs and symptoms, okay? And they're also giving us duration. So it's always important to take note of the duration of how long something's going on, uh, because that can tell you is it acute, chronic, um, and that can help narrow some things in um, or you know, cross some things off your list. The distribution is, especially in this situation, they're telling us it's a right elbow and right shoulder. And then they give us some recent medical history as well, okay? So um, that is relevant, um, the fact that he was seen 10 days ago for something. Um, so those are all important clues. And now let's take a look at the lead-in. This is basically a diagnosis question. What's the most likely diagnosis? So probably, an uh, a one-step question here. I think you could argue that we just need to use the clues in that vignette and put our detective hat on um, and come up with a diagnosis. A lot of times when it is just a one-step question, um, we know we're going to have to uh, put our thinking caps on and, and really start to figure out what's going on with those clues. So make sure you're taking good note of those clues. We'll go ahead and take a look at the answer choices and see what we're working with here as well. So again, five answer choices. So Let's take a look, um, answer choice E, systemic lupus erythematosus, D, septic arthritis, C, sacroiliitis, B, polymyositis, and A, gout. So we're gonna go ahead and open up that poll, go ahead and select, excuse me, go ahead and select the, the one that you think is the most likely diagnosis that this uh, 28 year old male has, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent. I did see a question about how often uh, do we have these tutoring sessions. So we have three different packages available. That info is available at rx-coach.com. And then, uh, you know, we recommend you meet with your tutor at regular intervals. The earlier you start, the better off you'll be. And you and your tutor will decide, you know, at what interval you should meet. We usually recommend about once a week when you're in dedicated. Uh, when you're in school, it depends and it varies. So that is something we will work with you uh, uh, to figure out together. And once again, that is because it is completely individualized. 
and no student is the same, right? We all think differently, we all learn differently, we all apply what we know differently. So sometimes these cookie cutter USMLE approaches don't always work because they do not consider the individuality of each student. I see the responses coming in. We'll give you a few more seconds. All right, let's take a look and see what you selected. And it looks like 54% of you selected answer choice D, which is septic arthritis. And second place was sacroiliitis, with 23% of you selecting that answer. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is C, sacroiliitis. And if this question looks familiar, that's because we have done this one in the past as well. So with that, I will hand it off to Boris. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, also a nice question here and a tough question as well. So let's take a look at this one yet. So this is a 28-year-old male who has arthritis, conjunctivitis, and urethritis. And we know that he had treatment for a chlamydial infection. So this really should be ringing bells for reactive arthritis. It's the triad of conjunctivitis, urethritis, and arthritis, formerly known as Reiter's syndrome, okay? So actually, on the next slide, Sean has gone ahead and pulled up a table in first aid that talks about this condition. At the very bottom, you can see reactive arthritis, conjunctivitis, urethritis, and arthritis. So there are some common infections, so GI infections may precipitate this, as well as sexually transmitted infections. So uh, chlamydia, Shigella, Campylobacter, okay? And this is one of the seronegative spondyloarthropathies, um, and that's actually the title of this table, okay? There are other types of conditions that fall under this category of seronegative spondyloarthropathies. Those include psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, and inflammatory bowel disease. These have a strong association with HLA-B27, and also sacroiliitis is a common finding, okay? And you can see there, it talks specifically about inflammatory back pain as well, okay? Sacroiliitis is a painful condition where you have inflammation of your sacroiliac joints, and it can be a sign and symptom of any of these seronegative spondyloarthropathies. So going back to our vignette, hopefully you can see, and as well as the answer choices, hopefully you can see why answer choice C is the best one, because this patient has reactive arthritis, okay, um, and uh, is at risk for sacroiliitis, okay? So why are the other answer choices incorrect? Well. Um, while uh, systemic lupus uh, can be associated with joint pain, uh, this patient is missing other characteristic signs like malar rash, things like that that you would expect with lupus, so probably not the best answer choice. D, septic arthritis. Um, this can be associated with joint pain, but there should usually be systemic signs as well, so fever, um, you know, increased white blood cell count, none of which we have here. Polymyositis, uh, this is a type of myopathy uh, where you get um, muscle weakness, but it's usually symmetric, and this is more muscle weakness rather than joint pain, okay? And on, on top of that, this patient's symptoms were only right-sided, and as mentioned, that's why we highlighted the distribution, helps tell us that it's not symmetric. And lastly, answer choice A in gout. So as we know, gout often affects some of the more common joints, such as the metatarsophalangeal joints, um, and there are some specific risk factors, such as alcohol, dehydration, red meat, um, and it's usually seen in elder males as well. So 40, 50-year-old males, not this age, um, so probably not the best answer here. So sacroiliitis uh, would be the best answer choices of those listed there. Excellent. Thank you, Paris. Uh, that was, as we can all see, a challenging question. So let's go ahead and move on now to our last question of the evening. As I mentioned, we do have a raffle and a special offer, so make sure you stick around until the end because you must be present to win. And every now and then, we'll have a winner that's not here to claim the prize, and we would hate for that to happen to you. Once again, the answer choices are covered up, and we will begin with a lead-in. 
which of the following is the target of the autoantibodies that are most likely elevated in this patient? Which of the following is the target of the autoantibodies that are most likely elevated in this patient? I'll give all of you a few moments here to let us know in the question box how many steps you believe this question will require, and then we will move on to the vignette. Next week's topic is going to be psychiatry. We hope you'll join us then. We do these question labs every Tuesday at 8 p.m. All right, let's take a look at that vignette. A 53-year-old man presents to the clinic with shortness of breath and wheezing of two days duration. Over the past two years, he has had multiple hospital admissions for poorly controlled asthma. Additional medical history includes allergic rhinitis and chronic sinusitis. On physical examination, he has wheezing across the posterior lung fields. In addition, there are palpable purpura distributed over his shins bilaterally and over the right elbow. Neurologic examination reveals weak ankle dorsiflexion on the right side. The blood eosinophil count is 1600, and as you can see there, the normal value is 30 to 500. Which of the following is the target of the autoantibodies that are most likely elevated in this patient? We want you to go ahead and start thinking about the important clues in the vignette and lead in as I hand it off to Boris. Thank you, Sean. So once again, we will go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette and the lead in. Okay. And so hopefully this is a fourth question today that we've kind of shown you what we think are important clues uh, that should be highlighted. Okay. Um, and hopefully you can kind of get a sense of, you know, what we're thinking in terms of what's relevant, uh, maybe what's not as relevant, doesn't need to be highlighted. So that when you go back and look at the question, um, you know, you can really start to be more efficient um, and uh, accurate with your highlighting. Okay. So hopefully we're starting to put on um, our detective hat, figure out which clues are important, why they're important to highlight. Um, so hopefully us doing that today uh, was helpful for you as well. So let's go over this vignette. Again, demographics, 53-year-old man. They gave us signs and symptoms. We also highlighted the duration of those symptoms, okay? They also gave us a little bit more of um, social history and medical history about poorly controlled asthma and how he's had multiple admissions. Um, some more medical history, and then obviously physical exam findings today. There's some respiratory, there's some cutaneous, um, and some neurologic findings as well. A lot of times they like to throw in blood markers as well, obviously, and they gave us one there today, okay? So those are all important in this question. So now looking at the lead-in, okay, they're asking specifically the target of the autoantibody most likely elevated here. So how many steps is this question? Well, one, I think we need to figure out what's going on with this patient. What's the condition? What's the diagnosis? What's going on? Step number one. Step number two, in that condition or process, what is the autoantibody that's most likely elevated? That's step number two. Step number three, what is the target of said autoantibody? So step number one, disease. Step number two, autoantibody elevated in that. And step number three, the target of that autoantibody. So we know this is a three-step question. We know what our steps are. So let's go and figure those out, okay? Let's take a look at the answer choices, see what we're working with. Answer choice E, oligodendrocytes. D, neutrophils. C, glutamic acid decarboxylase 1. B, contents of the cell nucleus. And A, acetylcholine receptors. So we're going to go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select the answer choice you think is the best answer here, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent. Thank you, Barra. So if you're answering questions today and you're thinking to yourself, oh, I knew that, or oh, I should have gotten that right, that might just be a test-taking skill that we can help you with or a knowledge gap we can help you bridge. So once again, if you're interested in coaching, please reach out to us at rx-coach.com. I saw a student ask us, you know, I've only got 18 days left. Is it too late for me to start? Absolutely not. We're still able to help you, and we've done that in the past. So feel free to reach out to us.
We'll give all of you a few more moments here to submit your responses. And then as always, we'll go over the correct and incorrect answer choices. Once again, we do have a special offer and prize at the end, a raffle. So make sure you stick around. And Jeff will also tell you about our special question lab next week, our one year anniversary, and what we'll be doing for that. All right, see the responses coming in. We'll give you a few more moments. Let's go ahead and take a look. So it looks like 43% of you selected neutrophils. And in second place was contents of cell nucleus. And that was followed closely by acetylcholine receptor. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is indeed D, neutrophils. And 43% of you got it right. So great job, everyone. Let me hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. Great job, guys. Definitely a good question here. Um, so nice job. Way to end strong. So uh, this patient has a few signs and symptoms, okay? He has a history of asthma that's not well controlled, sinusitis, and also eosinophilia. We're also told about peripheral neuropathy, okay? And we're also told about palpable purpura over the shins bilaterally, which should really make you be thinking about a vasculitis or some, some type of, you know, small vessel vasculitis. On the next slide, Sean has actually gone ahead and pulled up the table of our vasculitides, okay? And hopefully, you guys were thinking this, this is eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, okay, or EGPA. Used to formerly be called Churg-Strauss syndrome, uh, but we're starting to go away from those eponyms, okay? You can see there in the presentation, our patient had a lot of these, had asthma, had sinusitis, had that purpura consistent with the vasculitis, and also had peripheral neuropathy such as wrist or foot drop, okay? As we can see there, it's associated specifically with P. anca, okay? And a lot of these uh, similar vasculitides um, are what we call anca-associated vasculitides, okay? So this is a type of uh, anca vasculitis or vasculitis, okay? Now, what is anca? Well, hopefully you can see there autoantibodies um, under that autoantibody table. These are anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies, so anti-neutrophil, okay? So it's important, one, not just to know the word anca, but also to know what does anca actually stand for, and that's anti-neutrophil antibody, okay? There's P ANCAs or C ANCAs. We won't get into that uh, for this discussion, but um, basically anti neutrophil antibodies. Okay, so the target of these autoantibodies are neutrophils. Hopefully, that's, uh, that was the rationale for why uh, the majority of you got this right. Let's also take a look at the other answer choices, uh, what you may have been thinking there, why those are incorrect. Okay, so with answer choice E, oligodendrocytes. Antibodies against oligodendrocytes, you could see that in maybe multiple sclerosis where, you know, you could have neuropathy, okay? But the other stuff, the purpura, all the respiratory stuff doesn't really fit in with that. Answer choice C, uh, that can be present in type 1 diabetes. And you can have, you know, neuropathy as well in that. Um, but again, the other things, uh, such as the, the skin findings, the respiratory signs, the eosinophilia as well, um, don't fit in with that. Answer choice uh, B, contents of the cell nucleus. So this would actually be more of anti-nuclear antibody, so ANA. So keeping in mind our differenti differentiating between ANCA and ANA, okay? And you can see that in a variety of immune disorders, such as lupus, such as rheumatoid arthritis. Um, but again, we've kind of determined this is more of a small vessel vasculitis. And lastly, answer choice A, acetylcholine receptors. Uh, this you could be thinking about myasthenia gravis. Um, and patients can present with muscle fatigue. Um, but again, this doesn't explain um, all the other signs and symptoms we talked about. Uh, so the best answer here is picking up that this was uh, EGPA, or eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis taking it a step further to know that that's, a, that's associated with ANCAs or an ANCA-associated vasculitis, 
and then knowing that ANCAs are anti-neutrophil antibodies. So hopefully us going through these questions today was helpful for you, especially with immunopharmacology. And I will hand it back to you, Sean. Excellent, thank you very much, Paris. Great job this evening, everyone. I know we had some challenging questions, but hopefully it was a great learning experience for all of you.